Welcome. My name is Grace Murray from the Freer and Sackler Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. We're so delighted you've joined us today uh, for this uh, art-focused meditation session led by Aparna Sadhananda. Um, today's session, if you would like to stay after the 30-minute meditation concludes, um, we will have a spotlight talk about our focus artwork today, if you'd like to learn more, by Deborah Diamond curator of South and Southeast Asian art at the Freer and Sackler. And now I'll turn it over to Aparna. Thank you so much, Grace, for introducing and opening up this session today. And I once again welcome all of you to this art-based meditation. So for today's meditation, we have chosen a work of art, which is naturally a visualization aid for meditation practitioners of the Vajrayana tradition of Buddhism. So this is our focus for meditation today. The four mandala Vajravali Tanka. So usually we choose a work of art and find a meditation that aligns with that art. But today, this work of art itself is a visualization aid, as I mentioned before, towards the practice of meditation. And if you're interested, after this meditation, you can go to the link that Yinying has just shared in the chat, and you can learn more about that besides the spotlight talk that will follow this meditation. So let's start by looking at this tanka. So let's take a broad overview of this work of art. Now, a tanka means that which is unrolled. So during this meditation, let's hope we can unroll our understanding of this art. So let's maybe close our eyes and take a moment to center ourselves by bringing awareness to the body. bringing awareness to how the body is placed in space. where the points of contact are. And any sensations that are so overpowering, they seem to interfere with our ability to turn our attention in words. it in stillness. We'll take a moment here to make any adjustments. I will facilitate further ease. a quality, sustainable steadiness for the next few minutes. For a few breaths, bring all our attention to our hands. Noticing all the sensations in the palms, back of the hands, the fingers and the fingertips. Really intimately connecting with what's present 
in the hands just as it is. And as we observe the hands with so much intention and attention, let's quickly check in if there's any difference between the hands and the rest of the body. We might be able to notice how there's a quality of energy following attention. This energy is because there's a force of life within this body. And if we visualize that force as light, this process of paying attention could be imagined as allowing this light to flow into the subject of our attention. We're giving power and connecting with the energy that is in the subject of our attention. So in that awareness, maybe now open our eyes. To gaze at the scroll, at the tanka, in a way that not only are we energetically inhabiting the body, guiding that energy towards this work of art. We're also tuning into the creative energy that has gone into creating this art. And now, to understand this tanka, let's take a closer look, zooming into it. Allow your gaze to travel through this work of art. Zoom into it. Now closing the eyes, just taking a moment to absorb, absorb what we've seen. Reopen the eyes. Now pay attention to the center. And looking at the mandala from the center and taking the entire painting with our visual senses. Again, closing the eyes for a moment. Let's try to observe and remind ourselves what is it that we saw. And if your mind seems to be getting lost, lost in the details, or maybe all the nitty gritties the painting seem to be overwhelming. Just know that you can always take a few deep breaths in 
and reside in the breath like a refuge. Taking a deep breath in, deep breath out. If you can draw all that awareness to the core, to the abdomen, breathing deep into the abdomen and letting it go. Maybe we could share a few more breaths this way. Whenever we feel calmer and more connected to the self, we could open our eyes and gaze at the very intricate and elaborate work on this painting, perhaps noticing what are the patterns that seem to be repetitive. Bringing our attention to the circles and the squares. The border is at the top and the bottom. But then also, maybe that helps us to see any differences amongst these similarities. Perhaps we might be appreciating the details if we could look much closer than what we are right now. So let's go ahead and zoom into this further. Start by looking at the array of deities along the top border. Deities seated or present on lotus pedestals. Perhaps some of us will be noticing the thread stitches on the tanka. Noticing the different deities, the different figurines, the animals, Sometimes the zooming in and out that's happening could invoke many thoughts, many feelings, but just trying to see if we can still become a witness to all that's going on as we're observing and processing what we're seeing. can now come back and maybe focus on just one of the mandalas, one of these big circles. Perhaps now we're able to see these two outer circles. The outermost like a ring of fire. ring of fire and the yogi or the meditation practitioner who wants to enter this tanka 
like they have to cross this ring of fire to enter this square shaped structure inside this inner ring of lotus petals. And once the meditation practitioner could cross these two outer circles, they can enter the gates of the square shaped structure which is like the visual representation of the palace or the abode, the celestial abode of the deity. So take your time to pay attention to the different details, the, the number of circles, the deities along that the mind has to travel to reach the center, to reach the deity. And now let's go into a meditation practice, which may allow us to see how these circles might be represented in the self. After all, we are a microcosmic representation of the macrocosm. So feel free to leave your eyes open and continue to gaze at the mandala, this visual map as we meditate, or you may lower the gaze or close the eyes. And let's bring attention to the boundary or the body wall. Bring awareness to all the sensations along the skin of the body. Wherever the skin is in contact with the floor, with the mat, carpet, maybe the seat, the chair, there where the body is in contact with. I just notice the sensations of contact there. Minding these sensations, reminding us that we're here now. Tuned into this energy of the mandala while still being anchored in the body. This awareness that the body is present here in space and time. Sometimes the process of paying attention can create some tension in the body. And if so, can we find ways of relaxing into that sensation? Allowing the points of contact to soften, expand and take up more support. Symbolic of just allowing us to be as we are. Then we could go into an awareness that even though the body is, of course, made up of all the different parts, the different organs, there is a thread of energy or life, or prana, that is connecting all of these organs, that is infusing through all of these organs, giving the lifelike quality to this body. And the breath is a carrier of that energy into the body. So maybe we place a palm to the heart, palm to the belly. Just tune into that awareness that the breath is coming in right here, right now. And after finishing its journey in the body, it is leaving right here, right now.
maybe we could bring awareness. How this energy of life coming in with the breath is translating into so many different kinds of energy. If we're able to hear sound waves reaching the ears, mechanical effects, the mechanical energy of those sound waves translating into electrical energy in the nerves, which in turn invokes a response. And all of this is nothing but different manifestations of the same life force. And when we observe the body in this way, it's easy to imagine that the body wall is just a means to encapsulate all of this energy. But let's imagine the body wall like the outermost ring inside the palace that we see in the mandala. the breath, the prana and its different forms, all of this energy, let this be the light filling up the space enclosed by the body wall. In that sense, we could also imagine a second ring enclosed within the body wall that represents this sheath or the pranamaya kosha sheath that is made up of this pranic energy. Second ring. Once meditator has entered the palace. Now notice that even as we sit here with the intention to meditate and focus, the body might be invoking a lot of sensations. There might be a lot of thoughts coming up. And most of the time, these could be because the natural ability of the body and the mind. Look at the relativity. Relativity of dualities. So what seems pleasurable in this moment and be a source of pain eventually. What could be painful can eventually lead to pleasure. Like all of this is cycling. Notice where in the body there might be a sensation of heat. where there might be a sensation of cold. And in this way, where there could be a sensation of pleasure, a sensation of pain. And sometimes, even though self is a part of this experience, which belongs to the third inner circle, a little more subtle than the body and the pranic energy. But nevertheless, it's like a sheet full of psycho-emotional experiences. But then there is also a part of the self has the ability to witness these dualities. Part of the self which knows that any suffering is not because of these dualities themselves, but because of the identification of the body and the mind with these.
imagine this wisdom like an inner ring. Even more subtle in that it takes some patience, it takes some intention and focus to see the wisdom behind the dualities. Then transcending this wisdom is something that is the witness who cannot be seen without whom seeing cannot happen. The self, the most profound aspect of the self, which truly knows The self, which is not just a drop in the ocean, but is the entire ocean in a drop. In that sense, it is nothing but a microcosmic representation of the forces that the deity in this mandala may represent, right in the center of the mandala. Now we might be able to look at the self as not just the body, not just the pranic energy, not just the emotions, feelings, thoughts and dualities, it's not just the wisdom, but more so as the blissful center manifesting and projecting itself through all these different sheets of experience. Now maybe open our eyes if we close them to look at the mandala to see what it means to us now. Like if the yogi has to enter the center or reach the center of this palace, the ego, which creates this veil of illusion of separation, has to be dissolved into the flame, into the ring of fire, connect with the body and all the other layers of existence. Like at each step, we're saying to ourselves, I'm not just the body. I'm not just the prana. I'm not just the emotions or thoughts. Not just the wisdom. But I am the bliss, which is at the center of all of this. May we all close our eyes just for a few breaths to experience ourselves as the center, the bliss. Whenever we're ready to carry the sense of bliss of which we are an embodiment of, may we open our eyes, thanking the people who created and curated this work of art for us, acknowledging the self with the namaste, 
sharing the namaste with each other as a way of saying, light in me, honor the light in you. Namaste. Thank you so much for being a part of this meditation. I hope you could connect with this art in a new way, in a more mindful way. If you have any questions about the Pancha Kosha meditation we did today, please feel free to post it in the chat. And now I would like to pass on the screen to Deborah for the Spotlight Talk. And in a moment, I will share with you more details about the music we used. Thank you so much for joining me in this journey. Namaste. Thank you, Aparna, for that beautiful meditation today. Um, Thank you, Grace. We will move now to um, some uh, spotlight talk by Deborah Diamond, our curator of South and Southeast Asian Art at the Museum. While Deborah is speaking, if you have any questions or thoughts you'd like to share about the artwork, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Grace. And thank you, Aparna, for beautiful teaching and choosing such an extraordinary tanga, which I'm delighted to share in greater detail with you all. Let me just put on the PowerPoint I have. So my name is Deborah Diamond. I'm curator of South and Southeast Asian art, as well as Himalayan Buddhist art at the Fur and Sackler. And the tantra that Aparna chose for today's class is truly extraordinary. It was painted around 1430 in, in central Tibet by a Nepalese artist. And as she said, it features four mandalas. But for continuity with today's class, I wanted to take you straight to the center of it. Because the center commemorates the transmission of knowledge from students, from teacher to student. So you see um, in that central circle, two senior senior lamas clad in the in red and yellow robes of Tibetan monks. And one of them is the founder of Nora Monastery that, that was in central Tibet. And the other is the teacher who initiated him into the Vajravali cycle. And this tantra, part of the set, related to those Vajravali tantric Buddhist teachings. Here's a picture of Nur Monastery, one of the few I could find, because it was sadly destroyed in the 1960s. Um, but the story behind the Tonkas is that when the abbot was building Nur in the 1420s, he decided to honor his teacher by commissioning a set of mandalas related to the Vajravali teachings. And just as he made that decision, quite serendipitously, a group of traveling Nepalese artists arrived at the, at the un, as yet unbuilt monastery. And at that time, Nepalese artists were highly sought after in both Tibet and in, in uh, Mongolia. So they were immediately hired and they created this extraordinary, three extraordinary sets of tantras, Nur Monastery. So because Nepalese artists were so valued and so respected for the incredible artistry of their work, they were immediately hired. And these three sets of Vajravali Tangas that they did with 14 um, in each um, are still considered among the highlights of, of Himalayan art. So we're very lucky to have one here in Washington, DC. I thought I'd do some close-ups to tell you about give you a sense of like sort of the vast detail encoded in this memory palace of the Buddhist deity Vadra Yogini. So at the very center of all four mandalas, um, including this one, we see this graceful, youthful, voluptuous goddess serenely dancing atop a corpse. And she is adorned with all of these symbols of death. She's got a skull crown, a skull staff. She's drinking from a skull cup, which means she's drinking liquor or wine. She's wearing an apron of human bones, et cetera. And each of these has, has a specific meaning 
But as an aggregate, as a whole, uh, what this is about is conveying that she has overcome her fear of death. I mean, she is dancing happily atop, atop a corpse. And uh, overcoming that fear of death is, is a prerequisite for um, attaining enlightenment, um, for understanding the sort of impermanence of life and the impermanence of all things. And it's important too that she's beautiful because what her figure embodies is the reconciliation of opposites. Because again, in order to achieve true wisdom, one must understand that those dichotomies are false because everything is essentially the same in Buddhist teachings. I think also you can see with this slide that behind her in the background, there are these foliate forms that are swelling and burgeoning and have a sense of movement. And this is part of you know, conveying her vitality and movement. And if we look out, let's see if we can go out a little bit further here. Yeah. If we zoom out a little bit further, just to the next two circles, we can see that she's surrounded by offerings and goddesses. So the treasure vases are offerings, as are the goddesses themselves, who are forms of, of Vajra Yogini. And what I wanted to show here, because I was thinking about how to convey, you know, how the painting has meaning um, that's beyond iconography. So one of the movements that's very strong in the painting is this radiating outwards from the center of the mandala. So you notice, just for example, if you look at the very top of all of the skull crowns or the very top of the treasure vases, that they extend always into that next gray circle. And so they're pushing that energy outwards. And then each of those treasure vases and offering goddesses is in a red mandorla or a red halo, which is formed up of several sort of lines and contours and then set into petals or triangular forms. There's a lot of repetition of these lines, each shaded in a slightly darker tone of the same color. And that gives this sense of expanding outwards to the sides. I think of those little lines, the fact that these aren't solid forms, but made up of these multiple forms. It's kind of like those little bracket figures that some of us used to draw when we were teenagers trying to make cartoons look as if they had movements. Anyway, we have this much more sophisticated register, this movement out to the sides, this burgeoning outwards as well. And then if we go back even further, and look at um, most of this particular mandala of Vadra Yogini. We can see that because of the because the mandorlers are red, that they create this again this direction outward, like the spokes of a wheel, and those spokes are set to the four cardinal directions. So, with these spiraling foliate designs that are everywhere. Um, and the movement outwards and the movement to the sides. There's, sorry. Um, there are all of these different movements um, within, within the mandala itself that are beyond sort of iconography. And then there's the sense of scintillating colors and you know, reverberating colors because of the purity and the glow of the pigments, all of which are made from um, or most of which are made from semi-precious ground up minerals like azurite and malachite. So that glow and that luminosity contributes to the visual power and relates to the way that Buddhist texts talk about the appearance of Buddhas or bodhisattvas, the teachings as always luminous. Luminosity is a quality associated with wisdom. thought that the movement of this tanka also relates um, or resonates with the sort of movement that's inherent in the very concept of the mandala. So the mandala represents a three-dimensional palace of a deity. And it's encoded here within the, the circles and the squares that are like the blueprint or the floor plan 
of, of any building. So those are seen as from above. And then the deities and the offering vases, et cetera, are seen as if from straight on. So it's, it's between that view from above and that view from straight on that the three-dimensional unfolds. And this is what one mentally travels through, um, entering through the four gates that Aparna showed us details of before. And this is a monastery, um, it's a rebuilt, but a monastery um, on the Tibetan plateau, Samye, that was founded in the eighth century. And it's built as a, in the form of a mandala. It was sort of a duplication of, uh, of a monastery that was in Bihar in India, like in the sort of heartland of where the historical Buddha taught. So then you can see the central building, um, get a sense of the four main gates, the fact that it's in a large circle, so not quite a ring of fire, but, but here a gate, um, give you a sense of that visualization um, that one would go through when using the, the Tonka with all of its incredible details and forms and deities as a kind of vast memory palace that relates to the teachings of the Vajravali. And um, after that, I thought I would take questions. So, so one question was, um, when was this piece acquired by the museum? So the way that we can tell when pieces are acquired is by looking at their little accession number. So it's F1997.22. So that means it was the 22nd piece that was acquired in the year 1997. And there are about 15, 12, 13, 14, 15 mandalas from the Vajravali cycles from Noor that are in various collections around the world, although there originally must have been about 45. And I am, I'm pretty sure that they would have left um, the monastery um, before it was burned in 1960, but right before that, because it was a vital monastery until the moment it was destroyed. And now it's been rebuilt in India. Another question is, could you say anything about the one um section on the bottom right that's different than the other three? A lot of mandalas, um, you know, are set up in, in the way of the upper left, but there are also ones that are set up in grids. It's just each form of Vajra Yogini has her own particular palace. So in that one, she's in, you know, cosmic union with Havadra, you know, that union of wisdom and compassion. And it's just has a different kind of ground plan. Another question was about the headdresses that the deities in the center uh, are wearing and what the significance of those is. So the deities are wearing skull crowns. I mean, the whole thing is this overload of mortuary imagery. Like that's the, that's the key thing to um, show that they have overcome a fear of death. And we have um, in the Sapper collection in the Tibetan Buddhist Kandel shrine, we have a couple of skulls, crowns. They're made out of silver, but those are made for um, lamas to wear um, during um, tantric rituals. So they're pretty fabulous. I would take a look at those as well. Um, one other question um, is about the, um, are, are mandalas always depicted in four sections like this? This is very, very rare. It really, I think it's intrinsic to this set that so many mandalas are put on one, um, on one piece of cotton. I mean, it's particularly, it's, like, it's maybe the most complex of any mandalas and it's unclear how they were used. I mean, if they were used for meditation, um, we know that they would have been given as a gift as part of an initiation. So we don't know how they were actually used, but they do serve as these memory palaces mm -hmm. to relate to what's encoded in the teachings. Thank you so much, Deborah, for being here and for Aparna for the beautiful meditation today.